Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Saturday, April 11th, 2020, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. Alright guys, well, I hope everyone is well, as well as they can be, despite the situation that we have on our hands here. So, um, please do keep yourself safe and keep yourself well. This obviously is a real thing, whatever it is, but please do keep yourself well. And before I even get started with the video, which is, again, continuing in my series on the quote-unquote defiance or large hominids, as I like to call them, state by state, and next up is Nevada. And we're going to cover that in a second, but I just wanted to mention this to you. Um, you know, as current media seems to want to look at this thing, they often mention that this is a war. And they like to use that kind of language, which, you know, to me just indicates their demeanor, which is quite warlike if you want to ask me, because everything is a war, a war on drugs, a war on poverty, a war on this, a war on that, and real wars, and everything else. I'm talking about some very violent and unstable individuals running the show, and i just like to refer to you this quote by Aeschylus, who is a Greek tra tragedarian. He's the guy who brings us the Greek tragedy. And his quote was, In war, truth is the first casualty. Truth is the first casualty. A lot of other people have tried to claim this quote or whatever it is, but they're all, uh, you know, fakers, okay? This was the guy where the quote comes from, okay? Aeschylus, or Aeschylos, as the Greek pronunciation has it, all right? So keep that in mind when they refer to this as a war, because, uh, you know, they're mentally ill, psychopaths and sociopaths that run the show, you see, because those are imminent qualifications to be a leader in this world. Who seeks power? The very people who shouldn't have any. Okay, you and I don't seek power. We don't want to control people or tell people what to do or straighten out everybody in the world, okay? That's not our object in life, but that's what those people's objects in life because they're sick, you see. All right, so let's get to the uh, giants in Nevada here. And, of course, we know Nevada is home of the Lovelock Cave giants, of which I've done several videos on my channel about and I think people have the impression because that's the impression that they're given by so many people L.A. Marzulli and other people refer to the giants the red-haired giants in Wilmot Cave people are under the impression that all these giants lived in the cave but according to mainstream archaeology and anthropology the Lovelock Giants were actually the Lovelock people who lived in the area of the cave. They didn't all live in the cave, okay? They were a people who inhabited the area, all right? So let's get it straight, all right? So, Lovelock Skull, Nevada. <clears throat> In 1911, several mummified remains of mysterious red-haired humans ranging from 2 to 2.5 meters, 6.5 to over 8 feet tall, were disinterred from Lovelock Cave, 112 kilometers, 70 miles, northeast of Reno, Nevada. 
by a guano mining operation, okay? And the reason why they were mining guano is because they didn't want it for fertilizer for their backyards. They were mining guano because guano's chemical composition is a part of the mix for gunpowder, okay? This is for munitions manufacturing. That's why it was so important to mine the guano out of the cave, was to make bombs with, okay? These, substan these substantiated the local Paiute Indians legends of such people, which they call the Sitikas. Yet scientists prove oddly reluctant to investigate these remains, and eventually most of the bones were simply discarded by the miners, and also crunched up into little tiny little pieces. What was left was variously salvaged by various local people, only for the most of it to be destroyed when the shed they were kept in caught fire and burned to the ground. Hmm. Where have I heard stuff like that before? Hmm. I don't know. However, one of the Lovelock skulls, almost one foot tall, is preserved with some related bones and artifacts at the Humboldt County Museum in Winnemucca, Nevada, and various Lovelock artifacts are also held at the Nevada State Historical Society's Museum in Reno. Okay, so here's my problem with the Humboldt County Museum. I've gone over that in uh, videos on my channel, which I will put links to at the end of this video, they claim that the skeletons were, quote-unquote, slightly more robust. Slightly, slightly more robust. Okay, so somehow, at eight feet tall, or even at six and a half feet tall, these people were only slightly more robust, okay? So, my contention is, is that they are being intentionally misleading, okay? And their quote there is completely disingenuous. And just to prove it to you, I just want to show you what today's average height worldwide is. Okay, and this is by ourworlddata.org. The expected average height of a healthy population should be 163 centimeters for women and 176.5 centimeters for men, as defined by the World Health Organization Growth Reference Standards. Interestingly, interestingly the global average height is 159.5 centimeters for women and 171 centimeters for men. It's lower than we'd expect. And how tall is that? If you're from Europe or elsewhere in the world, you know how tall it is. But just to give other people a clue, 176.5 centimeters is 5 foot point seven nine oh six eight two four inches okay so saying that somebody who is eight feet tall is slightly more robust is completely misleading and disingenuous and it's done intentionally folks okay because these emotionally disturbed and emotionally immature people just can't get over themselves. You see what I'm saying? And they believe their own BS. Alright? Because they're demented. You understand? Alright, so now that that's out of the way and you see the actual facts and data now you can do some thinking about it, right? All right, so let's move on. Winnemucca, Nevada. 11 feet in height? Oh, no. What would they categorize that? A little over, slightly more robust? Come on, all right? Do you think I'm stupid? I don't appreciate you you thinking that I'm stupid. I'd like to knock your teeth out 
with the end of an axe handle. See, that's what you make me feel like when you say stupid stuff like that. All right? And try to insult my intelligence. Maybe related to Cardiff Giant. Okay, so this is taken at a time where, you know, the Cardiff Giant, I guess, was on the news there, but it's not related to Cardiff Giant because the Cardiff Giant was a giant block of stone. But these are actual bones. Bones of a human skeleton 11 feet high are dug up in Nevada. Winnemucca, Nevada, January 23rd. Workmen engaged in digging a gra in in digging gravel, okay, so here's another gravel pit burial, and my contention, based on the research that I've done on my channel, is that these larger skeletons, the ones that are larger than 7, 8, and 9 feet, are often found buried in these gravel deposits, which seems to indicate a completely separate time period from the other giants that are dug up elsewhere, okay? because we see it over and over again in many, many of the counts that I've already gone over. All right. Digging gravel here today and covered at a depth of about 12 feet, a lot of bones, part of the skeleton of a gigantic human being. Maybe human being, more like a humanoid. Dr. Samuels examined them and pronounced them to be the bones of a man who must have been nearly 11 feet in height. The metacarpal bones measure four and a half inches in length, as the bones in the hand are large in proportion. A part of the ulna was found and it is complete in its complete form would have been between 17 and 18 inches in length. The ulna is the bone in the forearm that goes down along the side of where your pinky finger is, okay? The remainder of the skeleton is being searched for, and I wonder if they ever did find it, but even if they did find it all, poof, it disappeared in a fire or taken to the Smithsonian or wherever. All right, let's move on. Lovelock, 15 inch sandals, as we've heard about before, and 200 pound balls. Apparently there was only one 15 inch sandal found, but I mean, you know, 15 inch, uh, that's uh, pretty large there. And again, you know, everybody, I guess, assumes that when they dig up all these skeletal remains, every single last one of them is an adult. And because of the strange and unusual skulls and craniums and the way the sutures are, are um, I don't think they make it heads or tails of which one of these things are adults or juveniles. But, you know, if they find a six and a half, seven foot a juvenile, they, I'm sure they automatically assume that that was an adult. But they're, again, I've said this again and again, they're making that mistake over and over again. Let's read this because it's very interesting. Yes, folks, everything I told you about in Red-Handed Strangers is true. This is uh, Chris, uh, um, the moderator of the of this uh, website, Greater Ancestors. There is ample evidence, Chris Leslie, there is ample evidence if you need to see everything up close and personal, just visit the Nevada State Museum, 700 Twin Lakes Drive, Reno, Nevada. Just call and speak to Dr. Gene Hattori. He'd be more than happy to show you around and absolutely prove to you that the Sitaka were indeed giants that used giant implements, wore giant sandals, carried giant bags, and ranged in size from 6.5 to 9 feet in height. And the 6.5 ones were probably the juveniles. A normal man could not even lift one of their bowls. A typical Sitaka bowl weighs 200 pounds. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to eat with a 200 pound bowl? They carried leather and rabbit skin bags that could easily carry the body of a human. Funny thing about them is that they were pretty good artisans and shaped their instruments in the forms of animals and creatures that cannot be identified. So these creatures that cannot be identified 
I would imagine are creatures from the Holocene that are went extinct, and some of those creatures from the Holocene have no relation to any animal that lives today that is so unusual and odd in their appearances that they would appear to be monsters, dragons, other things, okay? So when you hear about accounts of dragons and monsters and things from the past and everything, they're probably referring to the creatures of the Holocene or the late Pleistocene, you see? Very odd creatures. We can only imagine what they were. Okay, so when people talk about dragons and other monsters, well, quite conceivably be true what they're talking about. These are the creatures from the early Holocene that would appear to us today to be monstrous. You see? Dr. Hattori will tell you that a nine-foot-tall mummified body was stolen in the 20s by college students who boiled all the flesh off the bones just to get the skeleton, which they had standing in their frat house for many years. Oh, how wonderful our grandparents. Weren't they so cool? They're just like the kids today. Little, um, felonious punks. Another nine-foot giant was lent to the Chicago State Fair, where it promptly disappeared. Somehow, these massive bones are always stolen in the night to disappear from the sight of man forever. But at the Nevada State Museum, there are over 10,000 artifacts, enough proof for anyone willing to make the trip. Depicted above at the bottom right, you will see the remains of the fire that killed the last of the Sitaka as they were trapped in a Lovelock cave and executed by the Paiutes for no more reason than a boogeyman story about them coming in the middle of the night to eat their children. Unfortunately, the Sitaka were also referred to as tool eaters, an aquatic plant. I don't know why they weren't called baby eaters and children eaters and man eaters and all these kind of eaters, but tool eaters, aquatic plant eaters, it kind of makes them sound like uh, pussy cats. That on the left is a hundred pound pestle used for grinding grain. The women used it, and that's right, the women of all the American uh, uh, native peoples. Um, were the ones that handled agriculture and uh, all the food uh, processing. And there it is, a hundred pound pestle, okay? Uh, most women today couldn't pick up a 30 pound pestle, let alone a hundred pound pestle. So, again, more proof as to the extremely large size of these people and not remotely slightly more robust. That quote is for imbeciles to um, internalize. Lovelock Key, Lovelock Nevada, giant mummy. Okay, so we got mummies, mummies just like in Egypt, mummies for some reason all around the world, mummies just like in Egypt. Hmm, was there a shared knowledge on mummification? Certainly appears to be so. Several years ago, there was discovered in a cave situated in the desert range near Lovelock, a mummy known as the Lovelock Giant. Many stories credit the prehistoric Indian giant as being 11 feet tall. The truth is that the figure, still with reddish hair on the skull, was 9.5 feet in length. Wow. That's real short. It's almost like a dwarf or something like that, right? At nine and a half feet tall. The truth is that the figures... Okay, so the mummy is now in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. It is the largest human specimen ever discovered. And how many times have we heard that before on all the accounts that uh, I've read to you? Okay, so let's see what Chris says about it. I like the stuff that Chris says. We giantologists have to put up with the conspiracists daily. People that follow the word of the Smithsonian, these people will believe the world is conspiring against the Smithsonian without ever questioning whether this one institution has a long history of just that. There are people that would say all the doctors, medical examiners, journalists, and people from all walks of life are in 
incapable of honesty. The truth is that is we giantologists are simply pointing out that the Smithsonian and not everyone else is corrupt. The enemies of giantologists are the biggest conspiracists, and we are here to discredit everyone in the way of legitimate scientific inquiry. Right? That's what we're here for. Despite what the uh, jack-offs at the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian will tell us. Giant Prince, Carson, Nevada, Mysterious Tracks in Stone. The footprints of a Macedon and of a human being believed to be imprinted in the same rock. The discovery of tracks in the quarry at the state prison at Carson, Nevada created quite a flutter among the local scientists and brought up several eminent gentlemen from California to examine them critically. Dr. Harkness brought materials for taking photographs and also traces of them on canvas showing their direction and mutual relations. They will be poured full of plaster of Paris and exact casts made of them. Professor LeConte of the State University of California spent some time in examining the tracks and he informs the Reno Gazette that while they are very interesting interesting they teach nothing new there are the tracks of the mammoth and another another track which he thinks is that of a man he says some persons are entirely convinced that they are human but he is more cautious while he believes them to be so still there are doubts the track is so large barely being nearly 20 inches that it seems impossible that any human being ever lived with a foot capable of making such an imprint and it might be very right at that no human being ever lived but some humanoid lived that made that imprint like the many dozens and dozens and perhaps hundreds of different humanoids and hominids that lived in the past the peculiar outline of the human foot is distinct the current the the curved outside the heel bending inward the broad ball and wide front with the inward curve at the hollow on the inside of the foot are still there the professor says he looked carefully to see if it could be the footprint of a bear or some animal but found no marks of claws or toes which would be part of a bear track. He tried to imagine an animal which stepped with his hind foot into the track of its forefoot and made such an impression, but he found nothing to indicate it. Being asked if it might be a foot wrapped in bark or skins as a defense against cold, he thought not, because if it was cold, the mud would be frozen and there would have been no impression. Well, you know, come on. It could hardly be. Maybe it was cold, but it wasn't frozen. You know, it could be. It could barely be. It could hardly be that the foot was wrapped to keep the body from pressing it into the mud, as snowshoes are worn. For then the outline of the foot would not be preserved. As the whole human track is a puzzle. One thing remarkable about it is the distance between the lines of the tracks made by the right and left foot, the straddle, which is about 18 inches. The length of the stride is that of a common man being less than three feet. Well, maybe he wasn't taking full strides. But the size of the foot and the distance between them were those of a giant. It will be considered carefully by men of science, and no doubt more light will come. The track of the mammoth is about such as one would be made by the one in Professor Ward's collection now on ex exhibition in San Francisco probably never to be seen again the professor thinks the prints were probably made in the soft mud on the bank perhaps near the mouth of a river and soon after a spring flood came down and spread a layer of sand on them which was followed in years by the large deposit which became the rock now seen there the professor assigns the tracks to a period at least as far back as the glacial epoch okay so he's saying it's going back into the early holocene 
okay, and that guy, and thinks perhaps they belong to the Pliocene. There seems to be no great significance in the fact of finding human tracks, if they are human, with those of the mammoth, because it is long known that man appeared on Earth before the mammoth became extinct. Still, the discovery is very interesting to science and may lead to important results. And that's the New York Times, 1882. And the mammoth probably went extinct is because its large cells couldn't uh, cope with the new gravity after the catastrophe and cataclysm which everybody in science mistakenly thinks was some sort of ice age. Excuse me, I had to take a drink. Recent giant tools uncovered. This is from 2008. It's very interesting. Giant sized stone blades from salad plate size, elegantly crafted bifacial knives, and a unique tool resembling a double bitted axe to small blades and flint scraps. Discovered in May 2008 by Brant Turney, head of a landscaping crew working on the Mahaffey property, the cache was unearthed with a shovel under about 18 inches of soil and was packed tightly into a hole about the size of a large shoebox. Douglas Bamforth, anthropologist, anthropology professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder left and Patrick Mahaffey show unearthed artifacts found about two feet below Mahaffey's front yard at his house in Boulder during a landscaping project in 2008. A landscaping company uncovered a collection of 83 stone artifacts in 2008 during an excavation job at Patrick Mahaffey's home in Boulder, Colorado. This unearthed collection, dubbed the Mahaffey Cache, is, is one of only a few in North America, and its story will be presented to the Northern Nevada community next week. And here's what's very interesting to me, because people like William A. Ritchie from New, New York, who is the state archaeologist of New York in the 60s, who is the head uh, preeminent archaeologist, and his archaeology still stands today, often said that Artifacts recovered such as these found here in Nevada were simply votive pieces, in other words, sort of decorative things and the large size that no human being could possibly ha handle were just thrown in there as votive pieces for the person going to the afterlife or whatever it is. But here we see some evidence that would prove uh, contradictory to that. The fact that the tools were deposited as a single event and contain residues from Ice Age animals. See, now these have residues from Ice Age animals, so they were being used. Essentially provides us with a snapshot in time of what hunter-gatherers were doing. And you know what I think about the whole hunter-gatherer thing. Yes, they were hunters, but they also were engaged in agriculture if we were to believe that corn was being produced by people some 8,000 years ago and the many many years up to that point that it would take to create such a thing as corn okay so evidently agriculture goes way further back than what they say are hunter gatherers and all that kind of stuff so just ignore that Said Jeffrey Smith, University of Nevada, Reno, assistant professor in anthropology and executive director of the Great Basin Paleo-Indian Research Unit. It's a once-in-a-lifetime find, and again, I've gone over my channel, so is Chuck, CF Apps, on his channel, of the 76 sites they unearthed here in North America, the Paleolithic sites, only 14 of them showed signs of uh, hunting a large game. The rest of them did not. So what were they eating? Corn, maybe? With those nice clean teeth, as again, dentists and people, medical people often say that the diet, if they was to contain meat, their teeth would not be in the condition that they were in. 
We are thrilled about Professor Bamforth's visit and establishment of the Distinguished Lectureship in Archaeology series, Smith said. Dr. Bamforth's visit will serve as a model for future installments of the series and help to generate interest within our department among the campus community and general public. Bamforth received his doctorate degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1986. He has worked in projects throughout the country and has numerous published articles and books. More than 80 stone implements were discovered together in Boulder City limits by landscapers. A biochemical analysis of rare Clovis era stone tool cache recently unearthed in the city limits of Boulder, Colorado, indicates some of the implements were used to butcher Ice Age camels and horses that roamed North America, which went extinct but somehow uh, survived on the rest of the planet. Okay, so here are some of the artifacts. Rather large ones there. You can see that uh, wouldn't be comfortable for us to handle. All 83 artifacts were shipped to the anthropology professor Robert Yo of the Laboratory of Archaeological Archaeological Science at California State, Bakersfield, for the protein residue tests that were funded by Mahaffey. The protein residue on the artifacts was tested against various animal antisera and a procedure similar to the standard allergy tests and which can narrow positive reactions down to specific mammalian families but not to genera or species. I was somewhat surprised to find mammal protein residue on these tools, in part because we initially suspected that the Mahaffey cache might be ritualistic rather than utilitarian. Again, they're working with uh, some of the D-bag data that uh, people like William A. Ritchie from New York who said they were simply votive, you know. So if they have a residue on them, this is why the guy is surprised, you see. So you could throw away Ritchie's uh, research there because it's garbage. There are so few Clovis Age tool caches that have been discovered that we really don't know very much about them. Well, now you're starting to get a picture or a clue right there, smart guy. While the quality and patterns on several of the artifacts resemble Clovis Stone, it was the camel and horse protein results that were the clincher for me, said Bamforth. We haven't had camels or horses around here since the late Pleistocene. See? <coughs> Human beings inhabiting the Americas as far back as the late Pleistocene and before the supposed Bering, Lid Bering Land Crossing, which they moved back and back and back because they've been mistaken every time, and I'm sure they're mistaken now. The artifacts that showed animal protein residues were each tested three times to ensure accuracy. The artifacts were buried in a coarse, sandy sediment overlain by dark clay-like soil and appear to have been cached on the edge of an ancient stream, said Bamforth. It looks like someone gathered together some of their most spectacular tools and other ordinary scraps of potentially useful material and stuck them all into a small hole in the ground, fully expecting to come back at a later date and retrieve them. Yes, that's what we call a cache. And hunters and other people and military, they all do those kind of things today. One of the tools, a stunning oval shaped bifacial knife that had been sharpened all the way around, is almost exactly the same shape, size, and width of an obsidian knife found in a Clovis cache known as the Fen Cache from south of Yellowstone National Park, said Bamforth. Except for the raw material, they are almost identical, he said. I wouldn't stake my reputation on it, but I could almost imagine the same person making both tools. Okay. There is a magic to these artifacts, said Mahaffey. One of the things you don't get from just looking at them is how incredibly they feel in your hand. They are almost ergonomically perfect and you can feel how they were used. It is a wonderful connection to the people who shared the same and long, long same land a long, long time ago. Mahaffey said the artifacts will likely wind up in a museum, except for a few of the smaller pieces, which will be re reburied at the cache site. Okay, so again, you know, I often talk about Jimmy, the paleo man, man, my fellow researcher, my friend, my buddy who lives up there in Vermont, and the artifacts that he finds on his property there. A lot of people look at them and say, what, those things are nothing, blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, you know, here we see these things, whatever. Ordinary people probably walk right past these things, couldn't identify these things, but the things that Jimmy finds on his property are obviously... Um, uh, genuine 
and uh, I think you should pay attention to uh, the videos that he does on his channel. But by far, the highest concentration of giant artifacts is found in North America. Here, Douglas Fanforth, anthropo anthropology professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder, left, and Patrick Mahaffey, property owner, show a portion of more than 80, fa 80 artifacts on Earth. It is obvious that these tools were constructed and used by people of large sizes. No average size human today would be able to affect the to effectively utilize such implements. Once again, scripture tells the truth when it says there were giants in those days. And, you know, they, scripture or not, there were giants in those days because I've gone through great lengths and many other people have gone through great lengths to show that there were, whether they were Nephilim or Anunnaki or not, I think those are just fanciful flights of imagination, but I think uh, if they were around, then the history of uh, hominids and humanoids and human beings goes back a lot farther than we can imagine, and where did these rather large people come from? Pyramid Lake, giant skeletons and footprints. The Paiute Indians have a tradition that extends back, they know not how far, into the long ago, quote-unquote, of, of an Indian of giant stature who gave them trouble from the north. He took up his abode near Pyramid Lake and made war on the Paiutes, killing many of them. Well, maybe he didn't enjoy being called a cannibal and all that kind of stuff, you know. I, I might make war on you, too, if you call me a bunch of names and harass me all the time. The giant was finally slain by Paiute David, or where do you get that? name from, who crept up behind him and drove a poison arrow into his back between the shoulder blades, says the Virginia Chronicle. Two or three of the giant tracks and his grave are shown to this day. The tracks are near the Truckee River between Wadsworth and Pyramid Lake. They are in soft sandstone and are still kept clear of sand and soil. Every Indian that passes the spot stoops and sweeps out any dirt that may have lodged in the tr big tracks. The giant's grave is not far from where the tracks are seen. The giant's grave is always kept clear of vegetation. Any grass or weeds seen growing upon it are pulled up by the roots. In this way, the spot has always kept naked. The Indians also have a tradition of huge animals that roaded the country. They say these animals had horns which they were able to uproot trees. To rid themselves of these uh, giant beast. The whole Paiute tribe turned and well, you can't see the rest of the article so the Paiutes were big um, uh, murderers and manslaughterers and you know all their stories are a bunch of BS and I don't care if they're insulted by that and everything their stupid stories are nothing but demonization of the enemy and childhood fantasy tales about these people who ate you know aquatic plants and the giant animals that scared them because they were little pussies and they were scared of all kinds of giant things. Apparently the giants and large people in the Northeast didn't have that problem. Maybe they were a bit smarter. Maybe the Paiutes aren't as smart as they think. Supersized jawbone. It looks awful big to me. Stating the obvious to any observer on giant jawbone, one person that can tell and show us how large the skulls are is Stan Nielsen. He went to find a cave and a skull in the museum. The most qualified person to tell us about the supersized giant skull is Stan Nielsen. Prior to a subsequent trip to the area, borrowed a full-size plaster dental model of the lower teeth of a normal modern adult from a friend who is also my dentist. I took the plaster model with me when I next visited the area in the hopes that I would be able to compare it with the jaw from one of the giants, quote-unquote. As I had hoped, the curator at the Wittemucca Museum graciously allowed me to compare the plaster model with the jaw from the skull of one of the giants in the museum's collection. She placed the jaw down on her desk. I was allowed to place my plaster adult jaw Whoops, sorry. Next to the jaw from the skull, for purposes of comparison, the plaster model was much smaller than the jaw from the skull. In fact, the teeth of the jaw from the skull were almost twice the size of those of my plaster model. There were other factors, too, that distinguished it from today's humans. 
Supersize your bone. It has been falsely claimed by overexcited skeptics, who are actually uh, morons. The total size of the cast is smaller because of the full jawbone is not present. So let's take a look at a complete jawbone of the same size as the cast and compare it with the giant jawbone from Nevada. As you can see, the Nevada giant jawbone dwarfs the full jawbone of an adult male easily. So this claim hasn't been weighed and found wanting, but it's not something that we already didn't know. It is also claimed that the teeth, singular, and the mandible palate is not different in size. This is completely false. The giant teeth, when superimposed over the corresponding tooth or placed the exposed tooth in the same socket, really puts the skeptics to shame. It's best to address the types of claims and recognize the lengths that people will go to deceptively. With many of the skeptics of giants, they address, they, they address the weakest of claims. This is called cherry-picking a fallacy, logical fallacy. Even then, we see an interpretation is distanced from the average observer. The skeptics making such twisted claims is a result of confirmation bias, another logical fallacy. These two fallacies are similar, and basically for idiots and morons. Skeptics claim that the image is some kind of quote-unquote optical illusion, that quote-unquote normal humans, the mandible is indeed the mandible of a giant. For the skeptics to dismiss the native legends is racist. I don't know how racist is, but it certainly is stupid. To claim they are not giants, even after seeing this giant skull by the skeptics and groupies, is pluralistic ignorance. Another logical fallacy. Okay. Uh, you know, basically people who flap their hands and stomp around like a three-year-old because they're not getting their way. The naysayers and skeptics swing and miss over and over, and it seems they refuse to step away from the plate even after striking out. However, a better analogy is more like a child missing the piñata and calling everyone names. We can easily see there's no candy on the floor. You are facing the wrong direction, and you have been invited to take off your blinders. In the meantime, it does provide some gut-busting entertainment. It is clear that these skeptics are avid Darwinists and pantheistic by religion. I don't know about that, but they certainly are just, uh, you know, obtuse and uh, obstinate. Giant skeletons, skulls, mandibles, etc. are not so easily propagandized. Making claims against the obvious reeks of desperation, but I do not think that the comparisons here puts the skeptical campaigning on this one to a close. Winner by a knockout. Uh, but I do think that the comparison's a winner by a knockout. That's right. All the skeptics go cry in your bedroom and, uh, you know, here's a box of Kleenex for you. Petrified giant found in ravine. The petrified giant in Nevada last week, a correspondent informed us that a petrified that the petrified remains of a gigantic human being had been discovered in a ravine northwest from the Humboldt House in the Antelope Range. Yesterday, Henry Junkins and Robert St. Clair came to town and confirmed the report. They say the fossil was found in a deep ravine in which it had been washed or exposed by a cloudburst. Okay, so, petrified giant. Okay, another one of these petrified giants. And again, petrification is most likely an electrical phenomena, and we certainly know that the West there was blasted by something. If we were to uh, look at the Grand Canyon, for instance, a giant Lichtenberg figure. Wellington Station's horn skull, another horn skull. Now, is a horn skull a human being, a homo sapien? I don't think so. It's another one of these humanoids. Oh no, you can't say that. <laughs> Mommy, Kleenex, I need Kleenex. The Fronterizo reports the finding last week of a peculiar skull near Wellington Station at a depth of 45 feet. So this one's way down there. It's like a human skull, but has two horns about three inches long, inclined towards a large and well-developed forehead. It may yet be proved that men with horns were not rare in prehistoric times, and we do indeed know that because we've gone over that several times on this channel in the accounts of the giants. A large skull emerges Humboldt Museum. Oh my god, they actually let us see some skulls. Let's see how slightly more robust they are. 
Okay, and there's a quarter by the jaw there. Okay, this one even looks bigger, and their jaws are certainly different than regular Homo sapiens, sort of jutting out, sticking out, and then you have the eyebrow ridges there, and it seems to have a lot of their teeth. Weren't they eating uh, cheap candy and confections like uh, we do today? Well, you know, I guess not, and plenty of meat. I guess not. And the Humboldt Museum, uh, slightly more robust. Uh, yeah, I'd say that not five foot seven nine inches uh, average height worldwide. And I remember, they said that it was that's actually too big. Uh, the actual size is 171 centimeters for men, so considerably uh, smaller than that. You know, a little bit smaller, maybe. Uh, five foot six or five foot five is really the average height slightly more robust I'll give you slightly more robust come here so I can give you a knuckle sandwich Overton Giants at the Lost City Museum seven foot giants from Overton okay so I guess this is Chris Wesley. Here I am at the Lost City Museum in Overton, Nevada. I am here in Las Vegas on a job for a Pizzazz Scenic Company building a Smile End, which is a child's playground. We are building an, an IKEA here in Vegas. It is mandatory that we get days off every six days or so. We five theming contractors pick places to go on those days off. Before we go through the findings of this venture and I bring new information and clues to the story, let's first look at the leads, the research, and the history of seven foot giants that were written down in reliable news sources before this giant hunting expedition begins. Fine old home of giants who once ruled in America and probably a lot of other places in the world. Excavators in Long Lost City in Nevada find skeletons seven feet tall. St. Thomas, Nevada, March 6th, Pueblo Grand, Nevada. Long Lost City believed to have been the seat of a primitive people of giant stature who ruled Western America centuries ago and Eastern America and everywhere else. Was being gradually restored today by excavators working under M. R. Harrington, director of the Museum of the American Indian. And again, when they refer to seven foot skeletons, we're talking about late in the period of the large hominids, okay? The earlier ones, the ones that are 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18 feet tall, the further back in time, it's because the gravity changed, it's the only explanation for it, okay? And, you know, when scientists do experiments on how to create life, they mix up some soup and blast it with electricity, they never seem to make life, they never seem to, there are theories about what's going on with height and everything, and again, I've gone over it on his channel. Average height is this five foot seven inch tall, and for some reason, we've stopped growing. That comes from mainstream science, and that doesn't comport or agree with their theories about it, you see? So they're dumbfounded. They don't know why we're not growing, 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 because we have good health, good nutrition, good medicine, blah, 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 blah. According to them, we should just be growing, 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 but we're not. We stopped growing, and it's because the gravity leveled out, and all things on this earth can only grow to a certain size. We've gone over that through gravitational biology on my channel, if you haven't seen it. Okay? Exploration has been going on for months, but the only only recently, according to the to Harrington, has been uncovered almost incontrover, incontrovertible evidence that the once lost city will prove to be the largest prehistoric ruin of the Western Hemisphere. Big, sturdy, round adobe buildings, some containing 20 rooms with hard glazed floors, have been excavated. Under the circular courtyards are the graves of a vanished race, with the skeletons found to average over seven feet in height. A woman wrapped in a feather blanket was found in one circular burial place with a set of newborn twins buried with her, probably died in childbirth. Harrington has found beautiful shell jewelry, artistically cut beads, and decorated pottery of fanciful designs, in addition to quantities of crude hunting implements and other primitive tools. Several sets of perfectly formed dice, some with the corners rounded, were discovered in clay urns. The 
area embraced by Pueblo Grande is eight miles wide and extends intermittently with 100, 150 outcroppings for 35 miles down the muddy and virgin river valley, similar to that of the people at Galena Canyon. Okay, so here are some of the things that they found there or in the museum there. You see this nicely decorated pottery and stylized and, you know, textured pottery, beautiful textured pottery. I guess, according to the Paiutes, these would be filled with little children arms for them to snack on while they were doing their work, right? Because people who create lovely pottery and beautiful things and are craftsmen and care about their young and bury people with, you know, died in childbirth with beautiful feathered uh, gowns and with their, see, they would be capable of eating other people. Sure they were. You know, like the uh, tribes of cannibals we find today who don't have any of those things. They're just simply people living in grass skirts and bare feet and don't make pottery or anything like that, but are pretty good at killing stuff. Okay, so how is some of the pottery They're saying where the distance is here? Okay, so let's see what Chris says. So I called up the museum, and the museum director, Jerry Clark, gave a broad generalized dismissal about the giants, because he's a frickin' moron, saying that they were all Photoshop fakes and hoaxes. Oh, the ones from the Humboldt Museum were uh, fakes and hoaxes? <clears throat> Where is this woman? Okay. I like to talk to her myself. She spoke from authority. She herself was convinced of it and was very direct. That's because she's a brainwashed turd. She didn't know much about giant research, but was rather politely argumentative. Okay, because, uh, you know, these are politically correct people. That's their claim to fame. They're angry, argumentative people who need a swift kick up the backside. I tried to educate her of the validity of greater ancestry as a scientific model. I told her of the influx of the interest after myself, Chris Leslie, and Mika's research back in 2010. Mika is a biblical name for Michael. I told her of the other publications that spoke of the seven-foot skeletons found at the Lost City. This whole conversation was eerily similar to the same conversation I had in St. Augustine at the Fountain of Youth Park. Miss Clark handed me a photocopy of what she believed was a rebuttal to the mentioning of the giant seven-foot skeletons. I told her that I would include it as well. Almost from the inception of the first Lost City expedition, Clipping services began sending items not only from na national but from international newspapers about the finds being made on a Nevada desert. While some articles were well written, such as uh, such as the one by George C. Sutherland in the Salt Lake Tribune of January 25, 1925, others displayed flights of imagination describing everything from seven-foot giants to women's silk garments. Governor James C. Scruggum appointed M.R. to work in the government's interest. Maybe everyone but government employees are dishonest, and appointed archaeologists are the St. Christophers of their time. Using the word government, quote-unquote, automatically makes me a conspiracist for people getting paychecks from the government. However, all accounts, numerous accounts, speak of seven-foot giants. It is a bigger conspiracy to rely on one man, M.R., over a multitude of sources. I call these public conspiracists. And here again, uh, look at the gloves that they made there, it's just beautiful. The pottery shards and gloves were of such high quality craftsmanship that feathered blanket and silk garments should not be surprising. One, where are the bones? So according to the museum director, the skeletons were whisked away. In all the archaeological photos I could find, no images of skeletons. The pits were photographed at an angle in which skeletons intentionally could not be seen. I've seen this other times. And some of the research in New York, especially that of William A. Ritchie, they take a billion pictures, but often not directly of the skeletons, because 
they're scumbags. So this is not a closed issue. Were there any evidence of giants? The answer is, of course, yes. First, there were evidence of the greater ancestor of animals, some missing and some poorly displayed. There were mammoth bones and several other megafauna animals. MR himself, in the picture below, is holding a giant sloth claw. The image on the right is of the greater ancestors of animal bones at the Lost Museum. Large bones there. There's the uh, sloth claw. That thing must have been mighty big guy, too. There were some large obsidian spearheads and a large arrow tip of white obsidian that was far from being crude. One of the most amazing items was a huge pot, unbelievably large, guaranteed to be larger than anything in your kitchen or mine. No one can say for sure if of their use, but they were much too large for a present-day individual or a present-day family. The cabinet comes up to the hips in height. It was so much larger than all the other pots, six to eight times larger. It was the largest and most oversized item in a collection. And finally, there was a curious item that lay outside the building as they explored the Pueblo replicas and grounds. It was a stone slab removed from a local location and transported to the site of the museum, hoping possibly to find some six-fingered handprints, no such luck, but let, let me show you what is on the slab. And here are some petroglyphs on the slab. And, uh, you know, if these people are from the late Pleistocene or something like that, that's very interesting. I guess the other giant hunters missed this one. And uh, here's an article, another article about it. Lost Race of Giants. Excavations made recently in the Valley of the Muddy and Virgin Rivers, Nevada, under the direction of Mr. M. R. Harrington. That's the uh, R. Harrington guy. Director of the Museum of the American Indian are said to be have uncovered almost incontrovertible evidence of the lost city of Pueblo Grande, which is believed to have been the home of the race of giants who lived centuries before the dawn of history. Director Harrington states that the excavation has uncovered the largest prehistoric ruin in the Western Hemisphere. Adobe buildings, big, strong, and round, some containing as many as 20 rooms with hard glazed floors have been excavated, revealing under circular courtyards the graves of a vanished race, with the average height of skeletons found to measure over 7 feet. A woman wrapped in a feather blanket was found in one circular burial place with newly born twins buried with her. The whole... the whole planning appears to have been circular, the housing having walks radiating from a central sacrificial altar or ceremonial fireplace, okay? Sacrificial altar, again, you know, just, uh, just how these people killing and killing and killing. We'll leave that to the homo sapiens and the native peoples that came later, because they're murderous psychopaths, um, most of them and their stupid stories of the boogeyman to go along with it. In many mounds already unearthed, mounds unearthed, Mr. Harrington has found beautiful shell jewelry, artistically cut beads, and decorated pottery of fanciful design. In addition to quantities of crude hunting implements and other primitive tools, the area embraced by Pueblo Grande is eight miles in wet width and extends intermittently with 150 outcroppings for 35 miles down the valleys of the Muddy and Virgin Rivers. Again, just like Galena Canyon. <laughs> was set up, <coughs> excuse me, but Galena Canyon was actually much larger than that, and their dwellings were intact as far as I knew when the, um, uh, the rancher found them, but somehow they all got destroyed. Hmm, I wonder how that got happened, just like how all the uh, skeleton, skeletal remains just disappeared into the ether. Okay, guys, well, that's it on Nevada. I found all those things to be extremely interesting, informative, and very, very illuminating. And again, I refer to you this average height today, okay? And this notion that the people, these people that they found were slightly more robust. It's just a straight-out lie, okay? Because these political, politically correct, immature adolescents can't seem to say, you know, hey, you know, 
let's uh, consider this, you know, because they get their um, orders from the non-human entities from above. Okay, that we're not supposed to know anything about our past. See, because if we did, then we'd be able to make sense out of things, and they certainly don't want that. All right, guys. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Please hit the like button if you liked the video. I hope you did. And I will be getting back with a new video on the Giants very, very soon. Okay, everybody keep themselves safe and healthy. And, um... I'll see you real, real soon, all right? Bug got seven, signing out. Peace.